eventually after they move. And so one area was the Tigris Euphrates, and it was there that they started with trade. And in the beginning, it was just simple barter of work, you know, because you're trying to build things. And then it became, I could give you a bag of rice, and you could grow it, and you could extend it, and grow yourself a field, and then, and then, and then return to me the bag of rice plus. Because I've taken from my stores of food, and now, or stuff that can produce things for me, and I'm giving it to you on, on the good faith that you're going to return it to me. Because I, sh I would have been able to use that to grow stuff on my own or give it to somebody else that would have done the work for me. Why is it that I have to lose part of my hard work? Um, and so this grew until it became largely about cattle trading. And so cattle trading um, extended this, this economic idea to um, begin establishing new settlements, perhaps is what we could compare it to now if we were doing like a civilization type video game. So you'd have a group who I would lend you cows, you would use them to establish a farmstead and then return to me, say I say I lent you 30 cows, you would have to work it just like a video game, you know, and then, and then build up this farmstead and there's nobody around, there's no working technology um, other than what you can build and then you and the people that are with you, if it's just you, then you better know how to do something. Um, keep these cows alive and breed them because at the end of the year when the loan is due you have to return 40 cows And if you don't Well, then you're gonna have to work off the debt that you owe because this guy gave you living things That can do work and you screwed it up. You lost them or they died So you're gonna come work in exchange for those living things that you didn't take care of um and this worked pretty well, it seemed. Um, you know, there's still disputes, right? People want to get away with things. Um, and so the Anatolian merchants saw this system, and how it all took place, I don't really understand, but you can kind of see it in the myths, things like Jack and the Beanstalk. Um, somebody's taking their cow into market, and they come home with a bag of beans. Well, the cow gave you milk, but you could make it into cheese and butter, and the cow could, like, pull the plow, even though it was old and worn out. Like, what'd you do that for? What do you do with a bag of beans? Do you plant them and get a magic beanstalk and find a goose you can squeeze golden eggs out of? Because you don't even have a goose. You have a bag of beans. What's that going to do for you? Do you know how to farm? You've got, like, ten beans, and you had a cow. <laughs> you know, that's, that's, not, that's not enough to keep you alive all winter. Um... So, now here's the problem. You have a legal structure now in ancient Babylon that, that requires a biological currency in a language that has no intrinsic meaning, right? So the written symbols don't make sound, and there's no correlation about what the symbols look like to the sound you're supposed to make, right? We can see that when we look at ancient cuneiform and then we look at English. People try to make them look the same. Oh, it's based, it's like, yeah, right, whatever. The ideas aren't even close to the same that you would pull out of this. I mean, I mean, it's not even from the same kind of culture um, as, like, America, right? So they're not. Other than some of the stuff that came out ideologically, they're not the same. Um, so what you end up with is the, the Anatolian merchants throw silver into this trade network. <clears throat> and what ends up happening is, under the legal structure, you're supposed to take the silver and make it grow and then return more than you were lent. And, on top of that, you're having to now spend the silver to survive, most likely because you borrowed it as a consumption loan. You were a fairly honest person that was used to borrowing cattle and grain, and you figured you could borrow some silver for the winter because, you know, th uh, things had gone bad, and you were, these people were there offering it to you and offering you food. And so, at the end of the winter, since you weren't able to work and produce enough whatever it was you were producing to sell for the silver to come back to the lender and then offer them the 40 on the 30 day lent, you're a debt slave and so is your family and they never let you out. And so they took over the temples, these Anatolian merchants, and Wall Street was born and in that you have central banking connected to religion, politics, and corporations and they just started running the ancient world until it fell apart. Um, and then we have money showing up again in Greece. Um, 
mercenaries sweeping the islands and then setting up coins as uh, for trade and then Aristotle saying you can't charge me interest on coins because they're sterile and they don't breed anything to repay you with and he was ignored and so as the debt destabilized the population um, people were starting to panic and they, and they didn't know what to do and they, and they didn't want to be a part of it anymore because the Greeks were prominent philosophers that, that were understanding what was going on in the physical world and then comparing it to what was happening in the language and the ideas. I mean, it hadn't reached a level of sophistication as maybe the Vedas in like the deep philosophies of the universe, but it was, for mathematics and those kind of things, it was extremely powerful, logic and things like that. So, in order to curb these issues that are going on with the... Um, with the debt that's sweeping across the island, um, they're they're given the option to vote, and they're given coins to get in here now vote on how the debt is used to then control the population. And Socrates says you can't pay people to vote in a democracy because you corrupt their soul because he recognized that that essentially people are going to be voting on what they're paid to do. They're not going to be voting on what's good for the people. So that's the birth of democracy. And why it's such a powerful and violent force today with capitalism and central banking in the middle and so <clears throat> since the bankers understood that they didn't have to produce any currency to repay the interest with because the law says that the borrower has to produce the extra currency to repay the lender they've essentially played a magic trick you have a verbal agreement in which the lender is supposed to give you a currency that replicates itself so that you can repay the interest and you have a written agreement that says essentially the same thing and both you have to give collateral right you have to give something your house or your car or your life and debts they read back to the lender and but they're not giving you the biological currency you need to grow the interest required for you to fulfill your side of the loan and now at this point in history, just like it was 5,000 years ago, they had taken over the educational structure. And so they're teaching you, as you grow up, how to do mathematics, and part of that is interest payments. And they're suggesting to you that these things are good, and these things are right, and these things are what you're supposed to do. And so you grow up, and you take out credit cards, and you, and you, and you take out loans from banks, even though there's messages that you don't have to. To open, up, to open up businesses or do whatever it is you wanted to do and now you're in the trap and you can't get out. Um, and language is another part of the trap. Um, because you can't get out of that either. Now you're living in a world where you have all these descriptions of things you've never seen and you're using those to define the way you make decisions about things you have seen. Um, but because the things you have seen you weren't in a continuous context of awareness of what's happening around you in order to have memories to draw on about what this information in the language is asking you to talk about when you go to vote or cook dinner or drive your kids to school right and so as you're dealing with all this language you get in a wreck in the car you know, because you're texting, and somebody broadsides you, or you broadside somebody else, or you go off the road and sweep into something, or something, whatever, right? Um, because the language takes predominance. The same parts of your mind that deal with dreams and phenomenal reality um, can become activated when you're processing language. It's all in the imagination. The default mode network. Um, and so the language has, has essentially taken on the role of an artificial intelligence. And, and, and this may be confusing, but it's okay. I, I'm, I'm going to talk through it, and it'll, re, it'll refine itself. But since the, the letters trigger correlations in the mind, largely auditory, and then pictures, and those auditory trigger other ones based on how you were trained as a kid, you now have a self-referencing system. So, the, so then the books you're given generate your ideology of the world, which then controls the way you write books and then controls the way you present yourself to other people and then the back and forth of you talking to each other then controls the way that you present new ideas but very very rarely are they yours of any consequence 